And while you're turning to 1 Timothy, if you just now filled out, I hope you didn't put an envelope for Memorial Day in the offering. If you did, we'll figure it out. But if you have an envelope with money and name and stuff for Memorial Day, could you just hold that up this time around? See, seniors, run around and collect these. You that are current seniors, run around and collect them and uh, grab those and then get them to Mrs. Bates. Um, we'll wait till we get all these picked up. And again, if you if you want to bring your own food, do whatever. Obviously, do what you like. This is just something the kids are doing to to be a help and to raise some money for them. But if, um, now, did anybody put their envelope with their Memorial Day stuff in the offering? I'm not picking on you. I'm not going to make fun of you. I just need to know whether to go searching through it. Anybody do that? I don't mind if I'm, we're not going to laugh at you, honest. <laughs> All right, that's great. Um, and you can still sign up on Sunday. If you're not sure whether you're going to go or not go or whatever, you can still sign up for a meal. It just really helps us to know how to prepare and these people to get their, their stuff together. Um, in 1 Timothy, we are going to be here for a few minutes in some pretty familiar territory. But as I've just been praying about these lessons on prayer, I uh, you know, last week we... Started out with prayer for missionaries. The first thing Jesus said, I want you praying for, was pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. I was looking at these young people up here, and um, you know, Adam Servine over there, and on this side, and Trent Bailey, and, and uh, these, these young men, they're only a year or two away from graduating and doing something or choosing a course for their life. And you know, right now we'd like them to give us a winning football team, basketball team, and uh, we'd like them to get good grades and not break any bones, not need any orthodontist appointments. Or, you know, there's all these things that are important to parents, but, but ultimately we'd like God happy. And that's really what we want, isn't that right? We want God happy. And if you look through Christian history, there's some things God puts into our lives that we would not have chosen. But one thing we know, God wants people saved. Um, he would have, for, in Peter, he says, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God wants people saved. God wants, uh, that's the whole story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is getting a relationship right between God and men. And, of course, it's all centered around Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And you're going to see that tonight. So the last week we talked about that little phrase Jesus said, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'd send forth laborers. One thing we should be praying is that God would send laborers into the harvest field. You, know, you look at that one, the, the sixth grade class that graduated tonight, two boys and all those girls. So we're just changing our doctrine. We're going to start ordaining women to the ministry. Not a problem. Just go with the Southern Baptists and everybody else. Um, um, what's worse, the fifth grade class, right, has got no boys. Now look, some of you need to get on the stick here and have boys. Um, just figure it out. I don't know. I managed to have two and two. I don't know what your problem is. But uh, anyway, we'll give that to God. But um, <clears throat> when we, we look at these, these verses, we're just going to stay right here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and chapter 2 for not nearly long enough to do justice to this. So let's just, let's just start tonight again about prayer in the, the, to me using the phrase first, the first things in regard to prayer. Um, we're going to start in chapter 2, and you men that were at our men's meeting last month, I think I dealt with this a little bit, but in chapter 2, verse 1, I exhort therefore that what? First of all, first of all, this is big to God. Paul is writing to young Timothy, the young preacher, about how to set up the church. And in chapter 1, he establishes Paul's authority and Timothy's authority. In chapter 2, he establishes the role of the, the man and the role of the woman. In chapter 3, he establishes the role of the pastor and the deacon. And in chapter 4, he goes on from there. But in chapter 2, he says, now look, first thing, the first thing I need you to do when you, in regard to your church, the very first thing I want you to do is, reading there in verse 1, supplication, prayer, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men. He said, I want you, those words we blur into prayer, but supplication, intercession, intercession is praying on behalf of another. Um, giving of thanks, thanksgiving should be a part of our prayer life. Praying for people. Supplication is saying, God, we want your will. 
um, to go to God saying, I, 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 to be supple, to be moldable. Show me what you want. Guide us. We want your way in our lives here. When you look at your children, you know what we want for our kids? Good grades, good friends, um, good grades, good friends, good job. But we really we should want God. We want him to do your will. Just doesn't matter, God, whatever you want. And um, if, if the road is long and hard and the journey difficult, God, give them grace. And that's that supplication to go to God in your prayer saying, God, I want your will. And most of us, if not all of us, I would say all of us some of the time, and most of us off and on, we, we have our agenda and we're, we're trying to pray God down into our agenda. Supplica and by the way, he invites us to pray. That is saying, God, I need you to help me with this. But supplication is saying, but God, thy will be done. I really do want it your way. I want this, you know, we were praying for this young lady's husband that fell off a second floor balcony in Peru. And the Peru team, a missionary, went to college, graduated, married, joins a mission team, goes to South America to get the gospel. He falls and hurts himself and, and he's at de death's door and you know, of course we pray that he would be well. Supplication is whatever you want but nobody wants that you know, but that was what happened and here's a young lady in her mid-twenties lost her husband. Where does she go now? What does she do now? And, and so when we talk about prayer and I'm not going to go into each of these in detail but supplication prayer, intercession, giving of thanks but I want you to notice this next phrase. Be made for all men so when we start out Paul wants us to pray for others. Let's just summarize it. You want to outline my message tonight? We are to pray for others. That is a biblical thing. Pray for people. And we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. Pray for people. Secondly, in verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority. So secondly, God wants you specifically, and me, he wants us specifically to pray for our leaders. Young people, that would be your parents, your teachers, your I think parents, you ought to pray for coaches. When, I, when my kids are out there playing a ball field, I say, God, help that coach know that my son deserves to be in there. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, I, I want, our coaches affect kids' lives. Music teachers affect lives. Everybody affects a young person's life growing up. God, help them. Help them, God. And, and so pray for our leaders. But he says specifically for kings and for all that are in authority. So authority would be moms you ought to pray with your children for the dad dads you ought to pray with the kids for mom you ought to pray at home with your family and pray for the teacher the the pastor the the governor the president and i pray faithfully for our governor and our president uh, i pray for our our president's families and i don't pray that god kills them i don't um and i would like him to be out of office but that's going to happen in another year or so unless he changes the constitution and decides to become a dictator or whatever anyhow and that's up to god but but we're to pray for our leaders now look at it, it says i want you to pray look at verse two for kings and for all that are in authority there's a reason you're praying for your leaders that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty you know what you know wicked leaders make it awful hard to have a good life when your boss pays you a, a reasonable salary for a 40-hour week and then asks you to work 70, that's hard on you. I'm not saying right, wrong, whatever. Personally, I think it's wrong, but um, pray for your leaders. Why? So you can have a decent life. I'm not here to make you money. I'm here to glorify God with my life. Uh, I'm, I'm always concerned about our staff. You ask our staff members. I want them home. In our staff handbook that most of our staff's never seen, it says, I want you to be home three nights a week. You, you, you have a family. Now, if you're single, go run crazy night and day. I don't care what you do. Run yourself to death. But um, our married people, staff and laymen, all of our church members, I, I, don't want a, uh, I don't want a bus captain to also be a Sunday school teacher unless they're single. Because you need to sit with your family in church. You need to be together. You have, you have a family. And, and sometimes you can get running off crazy so much that you, man, we want good kids. We want our homes. They, our homes matter. And so, but it's that way with your boss. It's that way with your president. If our governors and presidents and lawmakers, if they're not thinking right, they're going to ruin our country. 
I mean, we will be in the Robin Hood days of, you know, of the wicked Prince John and, and uh, you know, people living, scraping by, hardly able to exist. That's not God's plan. But it is what men will do. So God says, pray. Pray for your leaders. We ought to pray that we don't end up with a Hitler in the White House. That, that should matter. 20% of the world's population is Muslim. Do you know any missionary working with Muslim people? And one-fifth of the world's population is Muslim. Maybe we ought to have some people saying, I'm going to go reach Muslims for Christ. And, and there are. We have, you know, through, especially through John Nelms, we have missionaries in the Middle East doing that. But um, the average young person graduating from Bible college does say, I can just hardly wait to go to Tibet. You know, I'm, I'm going I'm to go right into Iran and I am I'm, gonna, I'm called to Syria. And would, would we let our child be called to Syria? Well, somebody's got to go to Syria. He's just going to all the world and preach the gospel. So when he talks about praying for kings and for all that are authority, our political leaders can make our life horrible. Or they can make our life, what it says there in verse 2, quiet and peaceable in all godliness and honesty. So we should be praying for our leaders. If you want to write a note in the margin of your Bible, we don't have time to turn there. But let me read to you out of the book of Ezra, chapter 6. I wrote this down ahead of time. Ezra, chapter 6, verse 10. Negotiating when the king back in Babylon sent Ezra and said, I want you to rebuild Jerusalem. This is what he said. That they may offer sacrifices of sweet savor unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and of his sons. Even the heathen king knew he wanted the Jews praying for him and his boys. That's, and then a little bit later, in chapter 7, the book of Ezra again, chapter 7, verse 23. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? This heathen king knew that the prayers of the people of God would bless his family and bless his domain. And he wanted God's people praying for him. Now, he wasn't a Jew, and he wasn't praying, but he sure didn't mind them praying for him. So when we talk about prayer, the, the, remember it's in verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all, I want you to be praying. Pray for others. Pray for all men. You ought to pray for your neighbor every morning. Maybe rare. Maybe there's a rare morning I don't. But there's one window at the top of our stairway. I can look out and see most of my neighbors on two streets. And I pray for my neighbors, most of them by name. Some I don't know by name, but, but I've met them. And, uh, and I pray for my neighbors. My neighbors matter. Why? I want my neighborhood quiet. I pray that, that if they have kids, they wouldn't be hoodlums. Um, you know, we're predictable. They're going to know when we're gone. And, of course, that, that thing called a dog in our yard is not going to chase off any burglars. You know, that the neighborhood cat would eat it. And you know those big black birds that fly around, they'd carry it off for dinner and feed it to their babies. So I pray for my neighbors. And um, but, but, but we ought to pray. We ought to pray for people that we know and pray that you ought to have prayer lists for missionaries and prayer lists for sick friends. And, and I, I have so many prayer lists. I don't pray for the same people every day because my list varies from day to day. But look now look at that verse three, verse three. Now, why all this prayer for all these people? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He says this is an acceptable thing. You, when you pray for others, especially those in authority over you, God says, that's good, I'll take that prayer. That's an acceptable prayer. I like that prayer. Verse 4, who would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we are praying for these people in authority, where first for all men, but especially for those that are in authority, for kings and all that are in authority, and we want them to get them saved. We should be praying that people get saved. Now, there's plenty of Bible about praying for sick people, so I'm not condemning us when we pray for sick people. But I keep an eye on my prayer list that it does not get overrun with our body. Because God's not real impressed with our body. When he let 50 million of his own people get burned at the stake and fed to lions, he's not impressed with our body. When his own son was shredded, 
piece by piece and beat and, and just about everything horrible except the broken bone done to his body. Our bodies aren't the highest priority. And again, there are verses that talk about praying for health and God answers prayer and I believe that. And on our prayer list this morning, we were praying for some of you that are here this evening. We know you're sick, seriously ill. We were praying for you at the men's prayer meeting this morning by name. We pray for you. But on my prayer list, you know what really matters? People getting saved. That matters. That really matters. There's a man, um, years ago I led a lady to Christ and, and um, she prayed and she said, talk, talk to me, said, I want my husband to get saved. And she was coming to church and growing, and, but her husband wouldn't come. I'd go to the house and try and win him and he'd go in the bedroom and shut the door. How do you follow a man into the bedroom? You know, if he'd go to the garage, I could go there, but it's really awkward saying, excuse me, can I come in? And, um, and, and, and she was like a young convert, maybe a little too zealous maybe a little too pushy and kind of made him mad and I told her I said look just pray be a good wife love him and, and wait on God and pray and I said I'll be praying and we began praying and then one day out of the clear blue he shows up at my house and says can we talk and I said yeah we can talk and he just come back to the doctor diagnosed with stage whatever cancer the doctor said you've got less than th three months to live he said can you tell me how to get saved that was not that lady's prayer being answered but it was you know and she just about died uh, emotionally she said preach that's not what I wanted I said, well we were praying to get saved and he got saved and he got he never he was at church that Sunday he never missed church until he went into the hospital and right on schedule with what the doctor said you know you'd think he got saved got a church wouldn't be a miracle God heal him he didn't he went to heaven at his funeral, I could take you to the spot where I did his funeral. We just had a graveside at the Willowmore Cemetery. Nine of his closest friends all got saved at his funeral because they saw the change in his life. And it all started because a godly woman got saved and fell in love with God and followed God. But what a tragic, you know, on her part. They weren't very old. They were in their 50s at the most. And, um, but, but God wants people saved. And so our prayer life needs to focus on converts. Our prayer life needs to focus on mayors and governors and, and teachers. And we want people saved around. We want our policemen saved. We want our lawmakers saved. We want people to get saved. Because he says there in verse 4, God would have all men saved. Verse 3, it would be acceptable in God's sight if you would pray for these people to get saved. Why? Verse 5, for there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Look, if Jesus gave himself... For the world what was the point if no one's getting saved Jesus did everything he could do stretched out his hands his shredded body his body poured out all that blood that divine blood all the beating all the abuse all the humiliation and then no one's getting saved that didn't make God happy so our prayer life should be focused on souls being saved because Jesus did everything he could do. And our church ought to be, ought to be so passionate about soul winning. We should, be, we should be passing out gospel tracts. We should be passing out these John and Romans that we've got. We should be running these buses. We need two or three more buses running. We can do that. We can. Well, one of my big prayers for this um, school over on Lemon Street, if God would give us that, we could... Our Spanish church could mushroom there. Our English church could get larger. And our Spanish church would grow immediately because we could be running the same time of day. Because our buses could immediately start picking up non-English speaking people, drop the Spanish off there, the English here, and, and immediately we'd be reaching more souls. So many more things. Bearing Precious Seed is looking for a West Coast place to set up there to set up shop. There's enough buildings over there. We give we give Bearing Precious Seed one of our buildings and, and print Bibles and New Testaments right here. And we could be a part of this whole thing. What is what is it about? It's all about what Jesus did on the cross. And if he did all that, then what are we going to do? Can we at least pray that people would get saved? So that's the that ought to be the burden. Why is it we want last week's lesson that that um, we that God has send laborers well because Jesus died that's why so Paul wants Timothy look at verse 8 he says I will therefore so the summary of the first seven verses of 1st Timothy 2 I will therefore that men 
pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, he says men, and it is not generic. Sometimes the word men is generic, meaning men and women. God created man in his own image, male and female created he them. So at times it's generic, gender non-specific. But here it is talking about men, because the very next verse says, likewise, uh, like, in, in like manner also that the women. So verses 1 through 8 is about the men learning to pray, and then he goes to the ladies in verse 9 and following. Now, let's look at verse 8 for a minute. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. And there's just a list of things. First of all, lifting up holy hands. We need a revival of men who will pray. Men who pray. And again, we have three, three times a week. Saturday morning we have men who meet in the friendship room and pray. Wednesday morning and Saturday night we meet right here and pray. Um, but you don't have to be here. God wants you men praying. Verse 1, it's acceptable to God. You men start to pray. God says, hey, I like that. It's a very acceptable thing to God. There's some stages in Christian growth. The first one, of course, getting saved, getting baptized. Um, going to church is a part of that. But when you get a man or a lady or a young person to start reading their Bible every day, that is wonderful. That's a huge victory. But there's something, I don't even know how to describe it, something dynamic and powerful about prayer. You get a man or a lady or a young person who will start praying every day, 20, 30 minutes a day. Get a prayer list. Um, uh, we've taught on how to, and we can't do it tonight, on how to pray. We will in the next few weeks about how to outline prayers and all that. Your life will be different when you pray will change. I can tell how much I've prayed during the week by how Sunday goes. I hate to even say that because that means there's days that don't go as well. I remember Shirley Carruthers come up to me one day and said, Preach has a great sermon. I said, Thank you, Shirley. She said, We can tell when you've been with God. Well, you know what the antithesis is. <laughs> she can also tell, well, we just won't go there. I can tell. Now, now listen to me, men. If we know there's a difference when we've walked with God, then why in the world would we not? It's demonic. It is satanic powers. It just is. You know, it, it's hard enough to pick up your Bible. But to stop everything and to kneel in prayer. You know, it's easier to be a critic than to pray. It's easier to complain than to pray. I don't care if you're complaining about the Lakers, you're complaining about the pastor, or complaining about your wife's cooking. But So he says there in verse 8, I want men to pray everywhere. Then he says, lifting up holy hands. Holy hands, um, there's nothing wrong. In the Bible, Solomon lifted up his hands in prayer. It wasn't an outward public showing thing. Um, when the Bible talked about a wave offering, they'd offer bread, they'd do certain things that I can't get into, but they'd bring before God. It was a symbol of we're offering ourselves to you. Lifting up holy hands and saying, God, I'm, I'm clean. There, look, there's nothing hidden here. That's what he's talking about, lifting up holy hands. I, I, I want, it's like a policeman comes and you put both hands out the, the window. Just want you to know, no guns in these hands. And that's what we're doing to God. And, it's, and it can be symbolic or literal, but to say, God, look, I'm coming to you with nothing, no hidden agenda. Remember, remember when Jesus said, if you come to pray and you, you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that you've got something against a brother? To go get it right. He wants holy hands. God's looking for men that will pray. And then God's looking for men who will come to God clean. There's no agenda. Remember in, in Peter, he says that uh, husbands ought to dwell with their wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, that their prayers be not hindered. You come to God with hands that are holding bitterness toward your wife. God says, yeah, that one might not get through. God says, lift up holy hands. Holy, surrendered, clean hands. Hatred, anger, unconfessed sin. That's those hands that are dirty. 
And so he says, I want men to pray everywhere, and I want them to lift up holy hands. And then this last phrase, and we can spend the whole night on just his two words, without wrath and doubting. Now, who are we praying for in this story? Authorities, right? Leaders? Picture yourself a Christian under Hitler. You could have some wrath. Picture yourself a Christian in a day when Christians are being thrown in prison and tortured. There could be a whole lot of wrath. There be a lot of anger. He's talking about authorities in all this. It's kind of the underlying theme of praying for our leaders. It could be the wife praying for an unsaved husband who's not handling things well at home. But in specifically in regard to men praying, lifting up holy hands, and he says, I want you to do it. I want you to get rid of all that anger towards your leader. I want you to say, God, I will trust you with my leader. These hands, there's no bitterness, there's no anger, there's no wrath, God. You give our nation the president you want us to have. God, I'm going to trust you with it. That's why you shouldn't listen to too much conservative news because our conservative news people are right in many ways, but their agenda is to stir up passion among people. So you get so angry at these stinking people messing up our country. And you know what? Your hands are getting dirty. Your heart's getting dirty. Yeah, I'll pray for them, God. God, get rid of them. I said, no, no, no. I want you to lift up holy hands. No wrath. And you start praying and you think, God, you could bless that whoever the leader in your mind is. Don't doubt. Men are doubters. Without wrath and doubting. God says, I want you to come to me believing. I want you to come to me saying, God, I'm going to come. come. Look, God, I've got nothing but you. I've got nowhere to turn. I'm not trusting anybody else. i got nothing hidden here. I'm a mess, God. I've confessed my sin. You know I'm a mess. I know I'm a mess. And God, I'm praying for my leaders. I'm praying for this. I'm praying for my boss, my corporate leader. I'm praying for my foreman. I'm praying for my governor. I'm praying for my, my president. God, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you with the mess that's going on above me. God says, that is very acceptable prayer. That kind of prayer puts God on the throne. Because my bitterness takes God off the throne. And I'm saying, God, you know what you're doing. If you, were, if you understood this, you'd be as mad as me. If you understood this, God, but for men and women alike, holy hands, I'm doing what I'm doing because I trust you. I believe in you. And be it a wife praying for her children and her husband and her, her whoever is in leadership and her job or whatever. Be it a, a man praying for those in leadership in his life. But, and ladies, no offense on this matter of prayer because we're going to get to Hannah's prayer somewhere in the next few weeks in, in 1 Samuel. And we're going to study the miracle answered prayer of a godly woman who made a deal with God. She literally made a deal. God, you do this, I'll do this. And then she, she kept her word. But God, tonight men, especially you, but all of us, God's looking for some men who will pray. We really need men. These, you teenagers, these prayer meetings, be good to be here. It would not hurt at all for any of you adult men. I don't think Brother Josh should mind if some of you men or dads of our teenage, you want to come down and pray? Might be good to split up. Maybe some of the kids would be intimidated praying with the dads. I don't know if you would or not. I've been in these prayer meetings at camp. Our teenagers have no problem praying. Spend 30 minutes in prayer with our teenagers goes like that. They, it's not a big deal. 40 minutes, 45 minutes. We have to stop them praying. And they're, they're very comfortable in spending time in prayer. And that, that's one of the things that, that we want. We want our young people to grow up knowing God, trusting God. When we talk about prayer, there's a whole lot of things, you know, you can go find it, probably a thousand books on prayer. You know, right here, 1 Timothy chapter 2 is the best place on prayer. God wants you, especially. You know, I, I think the average lady prays because they're so insecure. You need God. You want God. You want oh God, my stupid husband, if you don't help, who knows what's going to happen? 
Yeah, but men think, oh, it'll be all right. Me and God, we're cool. <laughs> and she's saying, yeah, when's the last time you talked to him? Well, you know, I talked to him. <laughs> I thanked him for the meal last week. And uh, God, God wants you men. God wants time with you. So let's pray. Father, bless our night. May we be people of prayer. May we learn during these weeks to pray and to seek your face. And uh, we do ask for help, Lord. We get busy. But sometimes there's this demonic wall keeping us from prayer. May we be people of prayer, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless.